Thanks for checking out one of our messages online. My name is Caleb Combs, and I'm the gathering pastor here at the River. We would love to connect with you. Simply texting River Connect with no space to 97000, or you can visit our website, theriverchurch.cc, for more information. If you'd like to financially support the River Church, you can do that by texting an amount you'd like to give to 84321, or you can visit our website again and click the giving tab. We hope you enjoy and are challenged by the message today, and we hope to see you soon. Well, good morning, everyone. How are we doing? You know, it's snowing, and you lost an hour of sleep, and you're still here. This is pretty awesome, huh? It excites me. I, I love it. You know, it's supposed to be a down day, snow, and uh, I mean, some of you look like you lost an hour of sleep, but uh, some of us came to the 8 a.m. gathering, though, too. That one, that one really hurt, but uh, so glad you're here at the River Church. We want to welcome you. Welcome all of you online. Thanks for joining us. If you have a Bible, we, we will be in Mark chapter number 11, Mark chapter number 11. Ladies, I hope uh, tonight you consider going to the ladies' event. I, I had a blast talking to the 8 o'clock about uh, the ladies' event and talking to them about axe throwing and uh, climbing rock walls. It was great. Uh, but just so you know, those are all optional. They're not going to be like, you're climbing the wall. That's not what's going to happen. Uh, it's just a, a time of fellowship, and, and uh, so it's uh, just a time of worship. I hope you consider doing that. And I think it's good as all of our locations gather together and worship together. It's something, something very healthy. So Mark chapter 11, I read a story this week about a Sunday school teacher. Uh, she was the preschool Sunday school teacher at the church. And uh, it was getting close to Easter, and she said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask my preschoolers about Easter, because, you know, I teach about it, and they're going to know. And she said, okay, I want everybody to tell me, uh, who can tell me about Easter? She asked her preschool class, and, you know, one of the boys in there, who, who, me, who, who? And so he, she calls on him, and he, and he says, you know, teacher, uh, Easter, it's like when all the family gathers together, huh? and we, you have food and, and turkey, and, and then we watch football. That's what we do. So she, uh, she went, well, there's no, no football, in, but maybe he's just got it confused. Maybe Thanksgiving and, and uh, you know, Easter. And so another uh, little girl raised her hand and said, I know. It's when in the morning you come downstairs and there's that gift that you get. And so now the teacher starts to be discouraged. She's like, man, I've been teaching these kids and, 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 and it's been important. And, and so she just feels discouraged. And a little boy in the back kind of timidly raises his hand, and she says, okay, yeah, and he goes, teacher, Easter is when Jesus died on the cross, and he was buried, and now she felt really pressed. She's like, okay, they're getting it, but he didn't stop there. He said, and he came out of the grave, and if he saw a shadow, uh, we'll have six more weeks of winter. Do we really know what Easter is? Now, if I were to ask you to tell me about Easter, you probably could, you know, okay, Jesus' burial rose again. But I have a fear for the church that, that we don't have a growing understanding of who Jesus is. A growing understanding of who our Savior is and, and what he did and, and, and how he lived and how he calls us to live. And, and, and I have this worry that there are many that come to church around Waterford and Clarkston and around the country that there isn't this drive to grow in the knowledge of Christ. We are doing a series right now called The Countdown to the Cross. And our desire is that you will grow in understanding what Jesus did for you, who Jesus is, and, and how he lived. And in the book of Matthew, it spends a quarter of the book of Matthew, eight chapters, just on these last eight days. As, these, as Christ goes to the cross, it is, it is focused on this, last, on this last week. But I have a worry that, see, if we don't know the true Jesus, if we only grab bits and pieces, it is going to be easy for you to be tricked into following 
the wrong gospel. Ephesians chapter 4 says it like this. It says that, well, that you may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine. See, just as in Ephesus there were some that were tricked because of the schemes of the devil, they were fooled because they weren't grounded in the truth of the gospel. Paul was saying, hey, I, I don't want you to just be knocked down. I don't want you to be tricked. It says, by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness in deceitful schemes. It is one of the reasons that you'll hear me over and over again explain what salvation really is. Why? Because there's trickery out there that people think they know the Lord, but they don't. And that's why weekly we explain what is salvation? How do I know that I'm saved? You'll find we'll get in the baptism. I get the privilege of getting there again after this gathering or at the end of this gathering. And you'll hear us explain baptism. Why? Because we don't want you to be tricked into thinking that's something that saves you. We know that Jesus on the cross is what saves us. And we had communion last week. And you may be like, Pastor, every time we have communion, you walk through and you have to explain it every time. Why? Because there are the schemes of the devil Trying to trick people into rituals, trick people into thinking, oh, nope, I got it, when, when they're not grounded in God's truth. So this is the desire, is my desire that will be grounded, grounded in the truth. Let's pray and we'll go to the word. Lord Jesus, thanks for your word, Lord. Lord, I look out and it just blesses me to look at the church gathering together and seeing new people come and People in all different parts, all different places in their hearts, Lord. May they hear from you. May they know your love. May you use, use me this morning. Thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, first here's the timeline, right? Last week we talked about the triumphal entry. As Jesus comes really into the last week as he goes to the cross, that Sunday before, we call it Palm Sunday, Jesus makes this amazing triumphal entry into the city of Jerusalem where people are singing, they're waving branches, they're throwing their clothes, laying their clothes out as Jesus comes in on a donkey. The triumphal entry, people are singing and proclaiming what? Here comes the guy that's going to overtake Rome. They're going to kick Rome out of here. He's going to be the powerful king and we'll get what we want. That's basically what was happening in the parade. They were celebrating Jesus, but not for who Jesus really was. They were celebrating him because they're saying, he, he, he's going to give me what I want. And they missed Jesus. And the Bible tells us that Jesus, as he came into the city that night, he went into the temple. The Bible says he then left, went back to Bethany, a town outside of Jerusalem. And we assume his friends, Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, they were Jesus' friends. That's probably where he stayed. And the book of Mark really gives us the timeline of the next day. The next day it says Jesus gets up and he comes back into Jerusalem. Let me read it to you. Mark chapter 11, verse 12. It says, On the following day, when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree and leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves. For it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. Jesus kills the tree instantly. Later on we'll read that they come back after they went to the temple and Peter notices from its roots it's completely dead. Verse 15, and they came to Jerusalem, and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. And he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple. And he was teaching them and saying, is it not written, my house shall be called a house of prayer for all the nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. You ready for this? What happens when you're reading the Bible and Jesus doesn't act how you think Jesus should act? You're reading the Bible and you go, well, he did what to the tree? Wait, he, he, he went into the temple and did what? 
He flipped over tables. He kicked people out. What happens when Jesus doesn't act how you think he should act? Some people, even atheists out there, go, see, this is how we know Jesus is not really God and not the Savior because he, Jesus is just throwing a hissy fit. Or Jesus is having, Jesus just having a bad day. Is that what's happening here? Is Jesus just having a bad day and this is how Jesus responds because he's human? And some of you who are aggressive people, some of you aggressive people, you're like, this is like your favorite Jesus. You're like, yeah, baby, that's what I'd be doing. Except truth is when you do this, you actually do it because you've let anger and wrath take over. That many times you do this because you are having a temper tantrum. So I want to show you, because Jesus isn't having a temper tantrum. Jesus hasn't allowed anger to take over. Jesus is acting perfect. Jesus is doing what God wants him to do here. But what is actually taking place there? What is Jesus actually doing? See, what we can't do, and what many people do, is go, well, the American Jesus, that doesn't sound like it, so we'll just say it kind of didn't really happen. We can't do that because we know we have God's word. This says this is who Jesus is. This is what he did. So what does it mean? What happened there? And what does it mean for us? Well, first, you need to understand the temple. See, it says Jesus goes into the temple and he flips some tables and some chairs. Now, when I read this before, I kind of think, so Jesus went to this room. You know, I think there's like a mount or something. And there's this big castle thingy. And he goes into it. And there are people there. And, and so Jesus flips some tables. That's not what it looked like. See, first off, this temple was one of the world's most magnificent buildings there was. It took over four decades to build this building. They say it took some 10,000 carpenters and masons. The pillars, right? There were some pillars that were huge. They were 100 feet tall, covered in pure white marble. The door to the holy place is estimated to be 60 to 100 feet tall. This isn't some little tiny building. This is huge. And this takes you to the middle. See, in the middle was something called the Holy of Holies. The the high priest once a year could go into the Holy of Holies. No one else. And then you'd back off from there and there was another area and that was for the priests. And then, and then back from there was a court for, for the Jewish men. They could come that far. And then back from there was another court that was for the Jewish women. See, they couldn't go any farther. They had to stop. And the furthest away and The least important to the Jewish people was the courtyard for the Gentiles. Jesus goes into the temple. This is where he's at. He goes into the entrance where everybody enters. It is estimated there's some 35 acres of open air here. This is where Jesus is at. Jesus comes into here and there is a circus going on. This is when Jesus comes and he flips some tables, turns over chairs, kicks people out. Now, I know what some of you think. Jesus just kind of went, you know, he didn't really like, he just was like, oh, oh, sorry. Oh, that's okay. Okay. That's not what happened. It's much more powerful than that. I want you to see it. It wasn't a little small room. There wasn't like 12 people there. There were tons of people there. There were people selling and trading. There were people that have come from hundreds of miles. See, Jerusalem is, they estimate some six times the population was at Jerusalem at this time of the Passover. And Jesus comes into his house. And what does he do? He throws out the sellers and he throws out the buyers. And you may ask, well, what, I mean, did they let just people do this? Because it seems like, could anybody do this? And didn't, 
Were there like soldiers there? Well, here's what we know. We know that the high priests, Rome had given them the power. Rome had said, hey, you can have your temple soldiers. If somebody goes to a place they shouldn't go, you have authority to kill them immediately. That is the power that Rome gave to them. So if somebody thought, you know what, I'm going to the next court, I'm going to where I want to go to, the temple soldiers had the authority to execute that person on spot. Yet Jesus throws out the buyers and the sellers. I want you to see the power of Jesus here. Some may say, how, how, how could he do that? Well, just a couple days later, hundreds of soldiers will come to Jesus to arrest him. And Jesus speaks. And you know what the Bible says? All the soldiers fall down at the voice of Jesus. See, I want you to know the power of Jesus. When, when Pontius Pilate said, I have the power to release you. <laughs> Jesus said, no, you don't. You got no power. Daniel in the lion's den. It wasn't because Daniel put the lion in a headlock. It's because God said, shut your mouth. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fire, right? Why did the fire lose its power? Because Jesus is in control. This is the power of Christ. And here, Christ comes into his house, the temple, And throws out the buyers and the sellers. So my question is, what is Jesus doing there? What is he doing? The first thing I want you to know is this. Jesus is rejecting false worship. This is what Jesus is doing. Jesus is strongly rejecting false, fake worship. He kicks out the sellers. Well, who are the sellers? So what would happen is once a year, people would travel hundreds of miles to come to the temple. They'd have to come bring their sacrifice once a year. And so they would come into the temple and they came up with this business and said, hey, if some of these people don't want to bring their sacrifice this far, we'll just have them ready at a really good Walmart, not a good Walmart price. And so they would jack up the price so people would come and they would force them to buy the animal at a crazy price and they would make money manipulating the temple. Then there were some that would come with their animal. They would bring their animal and the priest had the authority to look and go, nah, that animal's not quite, it's, it's not good. Let me show you one that is good though. You can buy it over here. The Bible says that in, in Mark and Matthew, it says he kicked out the sellers who sold doves. Now, I think this is important because doves were the animal that poor people would have. They, 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 they couldn't afford a lamb. They couldn't afford those things. And so doves was, was for poor people because they couldn't afford it. And here the Bible is saying, yep, yeah, this is the place that they extorted people who came to worship God. They manipulated this. Manipulators. God flips their tables. God's not okay with it. God says, get out of my house. Why? Because he rejects false worship. One man said the temple was to be a place of worship, praise, devotion, a place where people could draw close to him and worship and sacrifice and offering and could seek his will and blessing. It wasn't to be a combination, a marketplace of a stockyard and a bank with hucksters and charlatans carried on their Greed enterprises under the guise of serving and worshiping the Lord. The Lord doesn't stand for it, doesn't accept it, calls it out, says, You have made my house a den of thieves. And here Jesus calls out false worship. 
Sadly, there are people that use the church today, right? Manipulators who abuse the church for their greed and their gain. I don't want to be that guy. Why? Because God is just. He's just. There was a lady, I, I've worked at the church a long time, and when I first started working here, there was a lady, her name was Deanne Mosier, just a wonderful lady. And Dee was the secretary and ran the books, and, and uh, I was just a young punk and, and doing middle school stuff and high school stuff. And so I would always have to bring the receipts and turn in money. And, and uh, so I'd always try, okay, Dee, I think I got, okay, this is the money that goes, and I want to make sure it's right. And I, I always remember Dee, she would say this. I heard her say this multiple times. She goes, well, it's the Lord's money. So if you wanted to steal it, good luck. Good luck. It's the Lord. He'll take care of it. And people want to manipulate and use the church. We see in Acts chapter 5, you want to see another story about people who tried to abuse, right? To make themselves look like they're something. Ananias and Sapphira, you'll find it doesn't go well. And here Jesus stood against false worship and kicked out the sellers. Because they were abusing the people, right? The Gentiles would come there. Now, these Gentiles, you may be like, Gentiles were allowed to come to the temple? There were converted Gentiles who would come to the temple. This is as close as they could get was this courtroom. And it was to be a place of worship. It was to be a place of praise. And it was a circus. But as you're reading, you may also see, you may say, Pastor, not only did he kick out the sellers, but he kicked out the buyers, why would, he, why would he kick out the buyers? Well, he, he uses this reference, you've made my house a den of thieves. And what Jesus was doing, and he did this often, he was quoting the Old Testament. And so he is quoting Jeremiah chapter 7. Now, I think when he quotes Jeremiah chapter 7, he, he gives you this one verse, but I think he's pointing to the whole chapter. Let me read you a couple verses. Jeremiah chapter 7, and this happened hundreds of years before Jesus it says, behold, you trust in deceptive words to no avail. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, making offerings to Baal, and go after other gods that you have not known? And then come and stand before me in this house, which is called by my name, and say, we are delivered only to go on doing all these abominations has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers in your eyes? Behold, I myself have seen it, declares the Lord. Jeremiah is saying, there are some, you come to the temple, and you come with your ritual, you come with, okay, I know I'm supposed to bring my aunt, I do this, I walk through the motion, and then you leave the temple and reject God in every way. Jeremiah says, you come to the temple and you go, he quotes it, we are delivered. Right? We come and go, man, I'm glad I'm delivered. I did, my, I did my thing I'm supposed to do and I'm good. And then we leave and reject God completely as Lord of our life. Reject him and go, nope. But we think if I do the rituals, I'm good. Jesus here says, No. Jesus here says, this is false worship if you just are doing this ritualist ritualistically. There it is. If this is just religion, if this is just a, you're just going through the motions, it's not real. And so what Jesus is doing, there are those who have come who don't believe in the Lord. They don't trust the Lord. What do you mean they don't trust the Lord? They, what the Lord says, they don't believe it to be true. What the Lord says is best for their life, they don't believe it to be true. What the Lord says to go and to do, they don't believe it to be true because they don't do it. But yet you come back and go, we are delivered! To quote a man every year, people who denied God with their lips and actions would come to the temple and proclaim we are delivered. They, th they thought they could just walk into this oversized confessional booth, go through the motions, and walk out completely absolved of 
their sins. Remember earlier in the day before Jesus got to the temple, he stopped at a tree. It says Jesus was hungry. And there was a tree and it had leaves on it. And that, that is to symbolize that the, the tree had leaves, so it should have had fruit. Jesus comes to the tree. There's no fruit. Jesus kills the tree. And some people say, wow, what a waste of the tree. No, no, this is one of the greatest trees in the history of mankind. Right? This tree has spoken to many people. Because what is the tree saying? Jesus See, in the Old Testament, fig trees many times would represent Israel. He looked at the tree and said, this tree is a faker. It gives the image like it's alive and it has leaves, but it has no fruit. And here, what is it? It's calling out Israel going, hey, you look like it. You, you, you go through the hoops. You, you make the image like you know me, but there is no fruit. It's fake. Reminds us of the word hypocrite. And we heard the, hear this word hypocrite used a lot in church. And as I was reading this week, I really liked what one guy said. He said, listen, sometimes people say, well, we're all hypocrites. And he goes, no, no, we're not. Right? A hypocrite is one who is inwardly corrupt and outwardly fruitless. A hypocrite is one who has no heart for God, but will do whatever is necessary to make sure that God, God in his life is appeased and the people in his life are pleased. A hypocrite is one who has no fear of God. See, we're all sinners. We all fall short. I, right? There's been times, man, I did not represent God how I was supposed to. But to be a hypocrite means there's no fear of God. That you are following the God of your life with the image, with this outward fakeness. And that's what Jesus calls out here. One said, it's like the leaf of baptism or the leaf of church attendance or of a certain prayer. What is Jesus doing here? He's calling out false worship. In Matthew, if you flip over there, Matthew chapter 21. Matthew gives us a little bit more insight of what happens after Jesus flips the tables, after he kicks everybody out, which is amazing, right? It says this. It says, and the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David. They were indignant. And they said to him, do you hear what they are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies? You have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. What does Jesus do? On this day, he rejects false worship and he restores true worship. See, that day, and I love Mark says this, says he began to teach and then it uses the word teaching again. And at the end of that section, Mark says, and at the night, Jesus went home, which means I think this is a day. I don't think this was like Jesus said two words, healed a couple of people, pff, gone. No, no, no. I think Jesus came in, and when, when this happened and threw everybody, he threw the circus out. True worship started to happen. That the blind and the lame came. And you may ask, why, why were they not afraid? Because the fury of Jesus was not on them. And they came to their Savior who healed them, 
It says children began to sing, worship unto Jesus, worship unto God. Here we see the true worship is restored. A few months ago, we taught, all right, the church taught on the Beatitudes. And I couldn't help but think about this. I think about who Jesus is loving here. The poor, the unwanted, the sick. And it reminded me of the Beatitudes. Blessed is who? The poor in spirit who realize they need help. Blessed are those who, are, who mourn, who are meek, who hunger for righteousness, who are merciful, who are pure in heart, who are peacemakers. I just thought about the opposite of all those things that Jesus is standing against, right? The arrogant, the hard-hearted, the proud, those who run after the world, those who are harsh and fake, those who cause division. See the separation here? Jesus is bringing this beautiful thing of true worship. And see, Jesus, in just a short time after that, a few days later, will change the temple forever. See, Jesus will change the temple. Jesus now, right, he leaves. In a few days, he's going to allow the high priest and the guards to arrest him. Not that they had the power to do it. He allows them to do it. Pontius Pilate, yep, I'll allow this. You have no power. And Jesus goes to the cross to change the temple. Jesus goes to the cross. He dies on the cross. And the Bible says, at the temple, in the middle, at the Holy of Holies, where no one was allowed because that was the presence of God. That was the intimacy with God. No one's allowed. It says the veil was torn in two. What did Jesus do? Jesus opened up the Holy of Holies. Because of Jesus and the cross, we now may have a personal relationship with Christ. We may now have true worship to Jesus because of what he did. To have true worship. See, Jesus said, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What was he talking about? Him. Jesus said in Matthew 12, I tell you something greater than the temple is here. What was he talking about? Himself. To quote a man, the, certain, the curtain was divided, the holy of holies from the rest of the world. It divided the court of the priest and the court of Israel and the court of women and the court of the Gentiles. And that division was torn asunder. In Christ's sacrificial death, the earthly temple completely crumbles to the ground and is replaced by the one Jesus. See, he changes the temple. We now may have a personal relationship with Christ to have true worship. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 says, But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. The Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. I told you that um, my wife is a public school teacher, and she's a music teacher. And it's been a hard couple of years. Of, of, she's a music teacher, so every half an hour, a new group of kids comes in her classroom, and she's having to sing with a mask on. It's just, it's just hard. It's been hard, and the kids struggling, and... and um, so she was happy when, when you know, the, the regulations changed and kids didn't have to wear masks. And, and, um, and just FYI, this isn't like a, where we stand on COVID. I heard a guy say, when the church aims more on their COVID stance than they do in the gospel, they have some problems. So, okay, we can be a little different and that's okay. At least some of us can, all right? Um, but that day came when, when the kids didn't have to wear a mask and and so my wife had not seen her students for like two years. And some of them, she'd never seen their face. 
And she was so excited to see their face. She was so excited to see them. And she was, uh, one of the classrooms came up to her door and she began to look, talk with the teacher and go, oh, I didn't think that that, that's what she would look like. I can't, and then she just started, you know, talk with the teacher and the teacher said, hey class, I just want you to know, Mrs. Combs is so excited to see your face. And Laura saw this little boy in the back. And he was in the back and he had his mask on and he took his mask off and put it in his pocket because he was so excited that he could see her and she could see him. And I thought about how awesome Jesus, you know what Jesus did? Jesus removed the veil. We, we get to come to Jesus. Jesus saves our life. We can have this personal relationship with Jesus. The veil is removed and we can know God. The Bible says the temple changed. You know how it changed? The Bible says this, do you not know now that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. See, it changed. What changed? Because of Jesus, now the Holy Spirit lives inside of us. So what does that mean? What that means is I wanted you to see this morning what Jesus was doing there. Jesus was calling out false false worship in the temple. Jesus was wanting true worship in the temple. Why? Because the temple is different now, right? If we know God, we're the temple. So what does it mean for us? Let's call out false worship in our life. Let's call out those things that, that are fake and ritualistic and religious. And let's Run after true worship of the king. Amen. Let's run after him. So this morning, if you know Jesus, be real with yourself. Listen to the spirit. Maybe he'll call out something that's a ritual in your life that's not real. He'll call out just the image that you have, but he knows your heart that it's not real. You may ask, how, how do I know if it's real? What do you do in secret? When nobody else sees it, when in your car nobody else knows, do you seek to honor the Lord? When you're at home and no one is going to know what you're doing, you're like, I, I can get away with it. Is there still a fear and a love to worship him? Because that's real worship. May we be a temple that fights against false worship. May we be a temple that has true worship. To read you one last quote, speaking of that temple, it says this, when a seeking heart enters the church, see, the church isn't the temple, the people of God are. So this morning, There's somebody here who has that seeking heart. They're trying to figure out, is this church thing real? Are these people real? So when someone comes and seeks, when a seeking heart enters our church, our home, our lives, our court of the Gentiles, may our actions say that God is alive, that God is holy, that God is loving. May our worship and our service say to the rest, that we love him with all our hearts. You see what Jesus is doing here? May we know the love that he has and the life that he has called for us who know him as Savior. Will you stand with me, please? Again, I challenge you to have a time of reflection. Man, it's so easy to just go, okay, and check out, but don't do that. Spend some time with the Lord right now. Spend some time praying, maybe repenting of sin, worshiping him, listening. 
to what the Holy Spirit has to say. Again, maybe you're in here and you've never accepted Christ. You've never accepted that true personal relationship with Jesus. It's only found in the cross. This morning, you can know that. This morning, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. Have a relationship with Jesus. Lord, thanks for this morning. I pray you used it, Lord. Continue to use it. May we truly worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.